Hey, good morning and welcome to worship. It's a joy to have all of you with us again today, whether you are here in person or whether you're here joining us online this morning, we want to say a special word of welcome to you as we continue our walking through this Easter season together, celebrating the power of resurrection at work in our lives. So once again, good to have you here. A couple things to note uh, before we begin this morning. Uh, one of those is that a reminder that after worship, we have a couple things going on today. One of those is Sunday school, 1015. They'll meet in here for opening singing. And for our adult forum this morning as part of our new series on prayer, uh, we are delighted to be able to welcome the Imam from the Mother Mosque in Cedar Rapids, Tahat Awil, here to our presence this morning. He'll be joining us in room four behind me here uh, at 10:15 uh, as well. So great ways to learn from other individuals of faith whose uh, traditions may be different than ours, but have lots to still teach us. So come and join us if you can. We'd love to have you be part of that conversation today. Our mission trip team is still continuing their uh, bake sale series out in the gathering area. So if you haven't had a chance to support them yet, as they head to Floyd County, Kentucky to do some significant uh, restoration after the, the flooding there last summer. We are looking forward to be able to do that. So it's a great way to support their efforts in that sense too. Two other things. Uh, one of those is this coming Saturday, um, the facilities team invites you to be part of a kind of an annual cleanup day. We're going to be working primarily outdoors with moving some dirt around, but also doing some indoor work too with polishing floors and such. So if you'd like to be part of that, um, see Bill Gellhouse. Where's Bill this morning? There he is right there in the blue shirt. Talk to Bill and he can give you, tell you what's going on. And we'd love to have you join us at nine if you have that opportunity. Coming up in a couple weeks, um, there is a special event taking place at Grandview College in Des Moines. It's our Synod Revival, the first ever. I'm told that the easiest way to describe it is it's, if it's probably the best, uh, closest thing that the Lutherans ever do to having a party. Put it that way, right? Even though sometimes we're not known for that kind of thing, um, this is a great way of us not just gathering for business, but being able to really celebrate one another's ministry. So 10 to 3 is the timetable at Grandview. There's no cost, no registration to worry about. It's just a great way to come and be, uh, have some fun with that. So um, reminder about that, it's taking place, and we'd love to have as many as possible uh, be part of that celebration. Looking forward to that for sure. Let's see, with that, I think we get to now turn our attention to our worship for today. So with that being the case, let's stand together, if you would, as we join in our gathering song. Love 
love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. Lord, come and fill this place. And I will worship you. I will worship you. And I will worship you always. And I will worship you. Spirit. Amen. We continue with our Kyrie. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. Fruit of wisdom, branch of peace, fruit of healing and relief. Come and gather beneath the tree of love. Here we raise the saving cross of Jesus, singing praise to him who leads us on from death into new life. Sweet forgiveness, Sweet forgiveness beneath the tree of love. Sweet forgiveness beneath the tree of Fruit of wisdom, branch of peace, fruit of healing and release. Sweet forgiveness beneath the tree of love. Here beneath the branches of your mercy, we invoke your name. Remember how your love has set us free. Beneath the tree of life, lay your burdens beneath the tree of life. Fruit of wisdom, branch of peace, fruit of healing and release. Lay your burdens beneath the tree of life. Rooted in the rich earth of your gospel. Your word has planted deep within our hearts. Come and gather, come and gather beneath the tree of life. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. Root of wisdom, branch of peace, root of healing and release. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the boundless love of God, and the company of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So thank you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Mercy on us all. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world. Pray to the Lord. Lord, have 
Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments, and to share his risen life with all the world. For he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We invite you to be seated and for our young people to uh, come on up and join me here at the, the Chancel Step. We'd love to have you be part of our conversation this morning. How's everybody doing today? Has it been a good week? Yeah. yeah? Is school still going on? Is it? You haven't stopped doing school yet, huh? No kidding. What's it going to take? You gonna, is it got a couple, weeks, couple more weeks before it stops, before it ends for summer? Just a little bit? Okay. All right. What are you looking forward to in the last couple of weeks? Anything fun? <laughs> Warm weather? Outdoor recess? All that kind of thing, maybe? Huh? Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Hey, I was thinking about today because we're going to hear a story in a minute that, um, about, about Jesus and some of his followers who uh, were kind of scratching their head. And why, what I mean by that is that they were a little bit confused about what he was talking about. You ever been confused before? Anybody? Yeah. It's easy to get confused. When somebody gives you maybe some directions you don't quite understand, or somebody wants you to go one way and you think you're going to go the other way, and you're like, ah, which way should I go? Does that feel very good to be confused? Not very much, does it? It can be kind of, kind of bothersome to, to find yourself in that place where it, it feels more confusing than it should be, right? Absolutely. So Jesus is, is uh, in his, this situation that we're going to hear about today, he's about to, ha- to ha- go through some really big changes in his life. And those who are following him are listening to him, and he's saying, hey, come follow me this way. But they're like, huh? How can I do that? For instance, let me ask you this. How many of you, if I were to ask you, if you could follow me as we go through this piece of paper without tearing it, how many of you think you could do it? Do you think you could follow me through that piece of paper? That'd be kind of hard to do now, wouldn't it, right? Absolutely. It'd be really tough. I, I could turn it this way. If I turn it this way, it wouldn't help? That doesn't help a whole lot? No? What do you think, Dylan? Your, your mind's turning. you got wheels turning there, I think. It looks like you're, you're thinking through this. Well, while we talk about this a little bit, I want to show you something because it may not be real obvious and real evident when you first start this out, but... Somebody suggested to me that actually it might be possible for me to follow me through this piece of paper after all. We're just going to see if we can make this work. I don't know if it's going to work the way I want it to or expect it to or not, but we're going to find out. How's that sound? It looks like a jellyfish. It kind of does look like a jellyfish, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got some, some long arms on it like that, doesn't it? You're absolutely right. It kind of does look like a jellyfish. You got that right. Well... So somebody suggested that maybe there might be a way that you actually could follow me through this. And I wasn't sure I believed them or understood what they were asking. But then when I, I thought about it, I said, you know what? Maybe there's more to this than I understand. And I think that's kind of maybe the way it was for Jesus' followers. There may have been more to it 
than what they understood him to be asking the same way. Do you think that's possible? Maybe. It might be the case, right? So um, let's see here. I think I got one more cut I have to make here. Otherwise, this may not work very well. But we'll see. Maybe it can. Does it work this way? No, there's one more cut we have to make here, I think, yet, too. And if I haven't got it all tangled up on myself, it might actually work. Let's see here. So um, you ever, ever had your parents kind of suggest to you that they want you to go follow a certain direction? You're kind of like, ah, I'm not so sure that's the way we want to go, right? Maybe you're at the store or the mall, and you think you're going to go over to the cereal aisle, and they're going to go to the green bean aisle, right? Something like that. So, yeah, we could all kind of have some of that kind of experience ourselves, too, where we don't quite understand just what's being asked. And maybe that that's kind of the way Jesus was. Because when Jesus says, I am the way, and Thomas goes, how can we know the way, Lord? We don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get where you're going. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Look at that. Now you think you can walk through that piece of paper? Yes. Now I think you could. What do you think, Dylan? Think that was possible? Yeah, now it's a lot bigger than it looked in the first place, isn't it? That's right. Pretty good trick, huh? Well, maybe as Jesus asks us for things we can't make sense of in the first place, we have to stop and think about it a little bit differently, too, and see if we can understand maybe what he means in ways that we didn't first think about, okay? So let's listen to the story, and let's see what happens today, and we'll go from there, can we? Let's pray. God, thanks for giving us a chance to come and be part of your story today. And even when we get confused, even when we don't understand, we know that you would never lead us into trouble, but that you would indeed always love us and walk with us. And you always promise to keep your promises. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. We're going to listen to our Bible story for today, okay? Appreciate you helping me with that experiment. The reading this morning is from John chapter 14. Jesus said to the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And if you know the way, to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells, dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father." I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Thanks, Gretchen, for getting us started in the Word today. Hey, a question for you as we start out this morning. If I were to ask you... Uh, what the difference is between a promise and a threat. How do you think you might answer that? Promise and a threat. Very simple question, to be sure, and yet 
one I think that probably also is a little confusing and for that matter has some pretty far-reaching implications when it comes right down to it. I mean, consider it this way. You know, if, if, if I said, I will always love you, is that a promise or a threat? Huh? <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> Seems like a pretty straightforward promise, right? Clear enough. But what if one says instead, I will always love you if you love me? Then what? Well, there's still a little hint of promise in there, isn't there? But, but this time it's a conditional one. And this time, lurking kind of behind or underneath that condition is a bit of an implied threat that says, if I don't right, love you the way you want, or if you don't love me the way I want, or if you don't love me the way I think you should, then all of a sudden, it's a little different. Right? So the language difference might be minimal, but the difference in meaning, they're an ocean apart. And I raise that issue of semantics because there's something very much like that going on here in this gospel lesson that Gretchen just read. I have to confess that I've always had a little bit of a, a love-hate relationship with John's gospel in particular, simply because I can get lost in all of the, the symbolism and the metaphor that, that this writer loves to use. And this text in particular has been one that's especially problematic, if only because in my experience... It's probably among the most misused lessons in any scripture in the Gospels. How? Well, there's a part of me that absolutely understands how that happens. I mean, truth be told, there are all kinds of ways in which you can get stumbled up and get tripled up on, the, on this reading. So please don't critique yourself very harshly if you do. And on the other hand, give yourself a little bit of grace, too, if, if maybe you're among those who are having a hard time hearing again or stomaching those words of Jesus when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you do a little bit of wincing there, you're hardly alone because to many a modern ear, that kind of a claim just seems, sounds arrogant, right? It seems excessive and dismissive. It seems almost tone deaf when it comes right down to it. Maybe myopic at a minimum, maybe even hateful at its worst. And it really does seem presumptuous in the minimum. That ways it just seems embarrassing. It makes it sometimes tempting for us to want to just chuck the entirety of our Christian identity altogether. I get for that. It's really tempting. But think, you know, if this is what Christians are all about, well, no thank you. I'll still steer very, very clear of you and your smug, seeming self-righteousness. You feel that way, I could be right beside you, believe me, saying the same. In other words, it's really easy, and unfortunately in our day, quite likely, that we hear Jesus answer to Thomas' questions, not as a promise, but as a threat, and especially here in the U.S., it's often been used as something of a religious litmus test, if you will. The idea to, to get to the Father, you've got to go through Jesus like he's some kind of bouncer standing by to vet our access to the triune God. Right? In or out, pass or fail. And that, that, I believe, is where its intent gets twisted beyond recognition. You see... We have here, the problem we have with hearing that statement from Jesus is that it's not usually Jesus himself we hear it from, is it? Instead, it's, it's other rather insistent and maybe concrete thinkers who want to use it as a weapon to bludgeon their opponents or those who just think or act differently than they do into submission. As a proof that anyone who doesn't believe as they believe or share their view of Jesus is not fit for heaven. The kind of people, in other words, it's very easy to want to shy away from. The kind of folks who certainly we sometimes prefer not to be associated with if that's where they are going to stand. But in this case, in this case, I think the key aspect to recognize for us, again, is the context in which those words were spoken by Jesus. And I can assure you it had nothing to do with comparing or judging of any respective religions. Because Jesus isn't 
in fact, speaking here to members of some other faith tradition. He's not even speaking to the Pharisees here. He's speaking to his own disciples. And his own disciples on Maundy Thursday, no less, in the days just before he was crucified, in other words. He's addressing a band of followers who, who are really starting to have their doubts about just where it is that he is leading them. In other words, these aren't seekers, these aren't marginal folks, these are folks who were seriously committed them to him, who have, who have could thrown in their, 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 their lot with him, and yet wonder if it's not time to throw in the towel now. Right? Wonder if maybe they, they weren't barking up the wrong tree the whole time, because the road is proving difficult, right? When it comes right down to it, there's not going to be an easy way to do this following. No automatic way ahead of them. They're under lots of pressure, in other words. Social, political, religious, maybe legal. Pressure to conform to the expectations of those around them by, by stopping pushing against the grain, by stopping going against the flow. And they just aren't sure if they've got it in them. They just aren't sure if they've got what it takes to follow one of Jesus on this road that's going to maybe include hostility and rejection and who knows what all. Maybe just sometimes apathy or derision or just being written off or somebody rolling their eyes at them to the point of, of eccentricity. Maybe they're just simply afraid of what in fact lies ahead and well they might be. Right? So what's being addressed here? It's their fear. The fear of Jesus' own followers that is the itch that is being scratched when Jesus utters these words. And that's so key, right? So key, because what happens? Jesus makes them a rather profound promise in this moment, right? A very profound promise. He says, in fact, though I go away, it's to prepare a place for you in the presence of my Father, and I'll come back for you, and we will be, in fact, united again in time. My, seems like my clicker is not working here all of a sudden, so pardon me if the slides don't match. All right, so he's going, we will be united together again. What is that? It's a sheer promise, right? All right down, a sheer promise, all pure and simple. There's nothing, nothing conditional, nothing threatening about what he says whatsoever. But as is often the case, with Jesus' conversation partners here in John, in this case, his disciples, they, they simply don't understand his, his metaphorical speaking. And they mistake his reference to a place, his father's house, for a literal geographical space. And so Thomas, again, asks for directions to plug into his GPS, and Jesus then responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. Again, here too, I believe, sheer promise. He's telling Thomas, Thomas, you already know the way. I'm right in front of you. You've already been there. You've already trusted this precisely because you know Jesus. He says, you can't get lost. Don't be afraid. But then comes that next line. And this is a lot of times, again, where semantics become important because Jesus continues here. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And this is where you do an extra layer of gulping, maybe. Right? Jesus, are you sure you should have gone that far? Right. Is this a promise or is this a threat? Because as of late, it seems like a lot of people, and a lot of Christians, hear it mostly as threat. Sure, there's a promise about being joined to the Father, but it's one that seems to be simultaneously pretty exclusive, does it not? And again, kind of conditional. And that's when the threat comes in. We want to read into it and say, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're finished. Or if you don't believe in Jesus the right way, then your salvation, well, it might be in doubt. Here's what respected New Testament scholar Gail O'Day has to say about interpreting it such. She says, to use these verses in a battle, a battle over the relative merits of the world's religions is to distort their theological heart. It's a dangerous and destructive anachronism to cite John 14 as the final arbiter in discussions of the merits 
of different religious experiences and understandings of God. It's a mouthful, but it says a lot, doesn't it? It was earlier in this very same gospel that Jesus has said, in fact, I have other sheep not of this fold. And he indicates that he has the freedom to call whomever he chooses, however he chooses, whenever he chooses, even for folks who don't know they've been chosen. And while we have to be a little careful, I think, still about how we use that kind of a statement so as not to become off as condescending or dismissive, it's one way of maybe answering that nagging question you might still have about somebody who's actively living out some other faith tradition, leading a holy life, as it were, clearly in contact with, with the sacred, but doesn't happen to, quote, confess Jesus Christ as Lord or as Savior in the way we might recognize. I find it immensely helpful in this circumstance to remember that the book of Acts it actually has at least a half dozen different places where Jesus' followers are in fact described as, named as, quote, people of the way. Right? People of the way. I don't see any evidence where it seems to be pointing to the way that they are as a way of believing. Right? What I do see is a pretty clear indication that these people of the way are those who love their neighbors, all of them, in the same unconditional, generous, caring, compassionate way that Jesus embraced those he met in those three years of his earthly ministry. Suffice it to say, there are a whole lot of folks in other faith traditions these days who might, in fact, be doing that a whole lot better than many folks who repeat Jesus' name over and over and over again. So in light of that, I wonder if it's not safe to say that despite all of the recent evidence and arguments to the contrary, this passage is not about believing the right thing in the right way or believing anything at all. Rather, it's about living as Christ would have you and I and everyone, in fact, live. Because in the wake of his example and sacrifice, right, that's what we are called first and foremost to do. Recall many years ago being at a rather uh, eclectic ecumenical gathering in Kentucky, and it was, it was one where I met Father Thomas Hopko. He happened to be a retired priest at the time who came from the, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And it was a gathering, like I said, of a really diverse crew of people from all over Christianity. A lot of folks who were kind of experimenting and doing all kinds of different sorts of things. But Father of Hopko followed one speaker after another, suggesting all the, the changes and the innovations that the church just had to embrace in order to be relevant, in order to be taken seriously by people in this, this age of diversity and tolerance and so many other traditions. And Father Hopko, however, suggested that the Christian faith wasn't so much in need of being just reinvented at the time as it was in need of being lived out as fully as we can. In the end, he said, maybe the best way of respecting other faiths, other traditions, is still being willing to boldly and humbly live out your own. Allow me to put maybe just a little icing on the cake here. If you would, Jesus continues his response to Thomas' question, as I said, by talking about his father's house. But again, he's not referring to architecture, per se. He's not talking about some synonym for heaven, I don't believe. It's pretty clear when he's talking about that. He's talking about relationship with him here and now, about abiding, right? And living with God right here, right now, right? amidst all the ways in which we already know, and amidst all the obvious challenges to do so. And it strikes me as an illustration, an invitation to hear and share a comforting, encouraging word, not from a place, again, of, of sort of smugness or security or power or any kind of, of spiritual arrogance at all, but simply from a place of honest vulnerability that respects the rights of others to search for God and to connect with God in their own unique, in their own particular ways. 
If you look at your, last, your bulletin, you'll notice how Jesus began this section. His opening words here are, are pretty illustrative too. They're oftentimes translated, don't let your hearts be troubled. He repeats it again a little bit later on. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Words oftentimes read at funerals, and so they make it seem, sound like we were used to saying, you know, don't be sad when I'm gone. But in fact, it's more like don't panic. Don't succumb to your anxiety or discomfort when others appreciate practices differently than you do. Respect them, he says, and then hold your nerves so you can learn from them even as they learn from you and that you practice your own ways of growing closer to God. The same can be true when agnostics or growing secularism just seem to be so much accepted as the norm. Hold your nerve, Jesus says. When it looks like the way of power mongering and money and, and celebrity is just going to rule forever, hold your nerve. I am the way. And, and, and those who follow my way, even though it's not going to be easy, are again, are not going to be disappointed, not going to be just abandoned. Hold your nerve. And when it looks like the propaganda of a dominant ideology just seems to be winning the day over and over, when everyone seems to just want to settle for illusion or feel-good platitudes or short-term thinking, rather than really wrestling with connecting with the holy, hold your nerve. When you get discouraged because your own kids don't seem to share the same values or the same faith that you do, hold your nerve. He said, I am the truth then those who insist on looking at the world through my eyes are going to find the truth one way or the other, and it will ultimately set you free. Hold your nerve when it looks like the powers of death are always getting going you know, to win, when massive firepower or economic muscle just keep squeezing folks, costing way too many their, their lives. He says, hold your nerve. I am the life. And my life is never going to be held ultimately captive by the grip of any death. I will come, he says, and I will take you to myself. And then the power of death will be broken. And all of you will ultimately one day be free. I am the way and the truth and the life, he says again. No matter what they do to you, they cannot tear you away from me. Or the Father who wants to share his love so desperately with you. They cannot separate you from God's love. They can't demolish my Father's house, which is built from you as the living stones who just are willing to keep building yourself up and hanging in there, right? For the way of life that I have shown you and I have modeled for you and I have led you to hold your nerve. This, Jesus says, is the way to which you have been called. Trust it. This is the direction in which you have been called to persevere. Trust it. This is the way of life for the those you claim my name. So we circle back to the beginning, and I ask you once again, does that seem like a promise that Jesus offers here? Or a threat. Right? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is that a promise or a threat? To my ears, and based on everything else Jesus says, everything else Jesus does here in these Gospels, the answer is really quite clear. The way may not be easy, but that promise is sure. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join in singing our hymn of the day, which echoes the words of that gospel text. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every
every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress Oh, you are my portion You are my hiding place I believe you are the way The truth Oh, you are protector. Oh, you are the one I love. Oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Now stand together and join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Now with brothers and sisters of faith across the world, across the globe, we share our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born, and was buried, who was dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And among all those we are aware of today, the special need of our prayers, we have folks close to home and our own families and our own community, and also folks across the globe. And so in the midst of God's ever-abundant mercy as displayed in the beauty of creation around us, let's pray once again for the church, for the world, and for the garden of all God's good creation. Jesus, our way, we give thanks to the community around us this morning and for the mutual identity that we are blessed to have in you. As living stones united in your spiritual house, we ask that you would continue to strengthen us as we go forth to proclaim and especially to live out your love and your love for all people. We pray especially for new congregations, for those who are discerning their futures, for our synod and our bishop and all those with whom we share ministry. Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. In Jesus, our truth, humble us as we share the fruit of creation around us. Fill us with 
a new respect and awe for the world that you have made and make us mindful of both the majesty and the fragility of, of rainforests and glaciers, ocean currents, animals, insects that all together, Lord, help us to sustain life as we know it. Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. Jesus, our life, you make your home among us. And so we ask today that you abide with us and with, with refugees, with those experiencing homelessness or incarceration, those fleeing violence or poverty, and all who question if there is a home for them in your heart. May we acknowledge and support such questions, even as we try to give them your hope and assurance today from our perspective. We pray, too, for those living amid violence today, whether in Sudan or Ukraine or India this morning, and, and all those grieving the violence in Texas and elsewhere today. Again, Lord, give us your hope. Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. Assuring God you accompany your people amid times and seasons of uncertainty and change, too. Uphold those in this community who maybe have recently moved or changed jobs or retired, those struggling to feel any passion for their vocation. We pray once again today for teachers and administrators, Lord, and librarians serving on behalf of the vulnerable in our midst, for legislators that they might understand the, the implications of their votes and stances, and for law enforcement and judges that they might help us to discern justice. Again, Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. Lord of compassion, we pray too for those who we know to be lonely or recovering or dying or ailing today. We ask your presence with, with John as he returns to work and with Cheryl and Ron and Sue, all who are recovering from surgeries. For Dale and Gary and Ken as they are cared for in hospice this morning. For Harold and Dorothy and those who are homebound or living in care centers. We pray too, Father, for, for Emmy and Nate and, and Mike and all those undergoing treatment for cancer any of those, Lord, that we dare to name before you in our hearts, that they too might know your comfort and your promise. Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. And King of heaven, you give thanks as you prepare a table for us. We are, we are humbled by the witness of your saints before us and humbled too by those other traditions of faith that keep living out, again, the kind of love that you modeled so very well for us. Lead us also into Christ's way of truth and all faiths that might be respected and dignified. May they each experience the gift and promise of your peace and your grace. Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. God, you know, then just for all those many petitions that perhaps we can only lift up to you in the quiet of our hearts this morning. Once again, Lord of the garden, plant the seeds of your mercy within us. And so God, receive these cries from our hearts today and once again, restore your vision of wholeness to our days and right relationship with you, with all of our neighbors, and with creation itself, we might discover your presence. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a moment before we continue now to share a sign and a word of Christ's peace with those around us this morning. To us that we might be again a source of hope and compassion for the world.
Now as our gifts are brought forth once again this morning, let's stand once more as you're able as we prepare our hearts to share in the sacrament that Jesus sets before us today. God of good gifts, receive these and all of our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Jesus Christ, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. And now with honesty of heart, let's pause to confess the reality of our own brokenness and our own sin. For God who tills and cultivated our consciences, forgive us. We cling to what has died and are bound by nostalgia of a perfect past. We hold tight to our assumptions and preoccupations about you and have been unwilling to experience the holy in fresh and unfamiliar ways. We clutch an Easter holiday rather than allowing the resurrection to change our lives. Meet us again, Lord, in the garden of weeping, and forgive us our fears, our sins, and our stubbornness. Amen. Scripture reminds us once again that Christ, the one we claim as our Lord, is in fact risen. And our guilt and our sins are thus left behind in the tomb. God now invites us once again to the work of initiating, intending, and nurturing, harvesting a challenging and yet oh so beautiful alternative vision of what life together can look like. Be at peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts then. Let's once again offer peace again to our Lord, our God. God. This is right to offer thanks and give praise. It was the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed, and he took bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is, in fact, my body, which is now broken and shared for you. Do this in order to remember me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks once more, he gave it too for all to drink and said, Take. And drink, each of you. This cup is the new promise in my blood, blood which is now shed for you and shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this too in order to remember me. And so it is then that we pray once more in the words that Jesus taught those first disciples, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come and share. All things are now ready. I invite you to be seated and come forward at the usher's invitation. Our bread, once again, is gluten-free. We have wine on the outside of the trays lighter colored grape juice on the inside.
shepherd, you make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by the still waters, you restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing, for you are with me. love and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love and mercy will follow wherever I go. Oh Lord, you're my shepherd, you make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by the still waters, you restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing, for you are with me. follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Now we've been fed once again at this, our Lord's table of grace. Let's stand together and receive blessing. Living God, you have fed us with your word, and our hearts burn within us. For through this meal, you opened us to your presence. Now send us forth to share the gifts of you with your Easter garden of grace with every brother and sister. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Remain standing for our ascending hymn, Mighty to Save. Let's sing together. Everyone needs compassion, a 
love that's never failing, that mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, Everything I believe in, now I surrender, yes I surrender. can for a time of uh, some learning, whether it's your Sunday school here, whether it's at our adult forum. Um, meanwhile, enjoy some refreshments out in the gathering area. We hope to see you later this week, whether it's on Saturday for the projects or next Sunday for worship. Go in peace then, to love Christ, to live Christ, and to share Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.